Church praise team for reminding us that God's eye is not only on the sparrow, but it is on each of us, and he never lets go, no matter what we face. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to go ahead and be turning to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament as we finish up chapter 6. If God's eye is on the sparrow, and he watches over the sparrow, the question this morning is this. Is God going to be watching the big game tonight, and does he care who wins? Before That, my friends, is part trick question. For some of you, you automatically said, no, he doesn't care who wins. I would submit to you this morning that our God, who is in the heavens, our God whose eye is on the sparrow, our God whose eye is on you and I, our God whose eye is even down to the subatomic molecular structure who has knit us together in our mother's womb, he is intimately aware of what's going on. And he is concerned about tonight's game, not the way we would be concerned about it, not the way we would look at it, but he is concerned for ultimately his honor and for his glory. And so as we watch tonight, might we watch through those lens? You know, tonight for some on the now L.A. Rams who will be back in their first Super Bowl since they moved back to L.A. from St. Louis, most if not all of those players will have virtually no Super Bowl experience. They will be intimidated just by being in, in your first Super Bowl is an intimidating experience enough, but yet they, they have a second, perhaps even more intimidating aspect of the game in that they will be facing the GOAT, the greatest of all time by the name of Tom Brady. No, I'm not going there, because that that would be a whole different sermon. Well, you see, they will play tonight. And if the L.A. Rams are to defeat the New England Patriots, they will need a stellar defense, hearkening back to the days of the fearsome foursome. Rosie Greer, Lamar Lundy, Merlin Olsen. Most of us know Merlin Olsen not from when he played for the L.A. Rams, but from his time spent as a sidekick to Michael Landon and for selling us flowers, and old Deacon Jones. Defense usually wins ball games. Just to ask the team up the street by the name of the Baltimore Ravens, who were never known for their stellar offense, but always for their intimidating defenses. Now, now we're going to just get a little uh, interactive here. Uh, There are other defenses throughout the history of the National Football League that have been intimidating, that have won. And if you know the name of the team just by their nickname, you can go ahead and yell it out. Of course, we have... What was that? Have I said the name of any defense yet? No. You have to wait. You have to wait till at least one word is out before you buzz. Okay, that's not the first one, just, just because that's how it happened to be on the page except for the last one. Monsters of the Midway, the Bears, the Steel Curtain, Pittsburgh, there you go, the Purple People Eaters, the Vikings. Of course, Alan Page, Carl Eller, Jim Marshall, Gary Larson, all the guys. This is for a few of you here in the house this morning. The Doomsday Defense. That's about how many people answered in the first service. <laughs> Ed Tutal Jones, Randy White, Mel Friend, Fro, and others. But I would submit to you that the greatest defense that has ever played an entire season went by the no name defense. 1973, Miami Dolphins. 
Why do I say that they're the greatest defense has ever played a single season? Because they never gave up a single victory to the other team, a perfect 16-0 and all the way through the Super Bowl, something that the New England Patriots had going into their Super Bowl with the Giants but could not accomplish. Nick Bonacani, Manny Fernandez, Dick Anderson, and Jake Scott. No, we did not name our Jacob Scott because of Jake Scott of the Dolphins. And although we may never face those kind of intimidating defenses in our life, as we saw last week, we will be discouraged by the enemy. And in fact, if the enemy cannot discourage us, he will downright try to intimidate us. Uh, We face intimidation every day of our lives, and how we respond to that intimidation will make all the difference in how we live out the Christian life from day to day today. Folks, our master opponent, our chief opponent, Satan, would love nothing more if he cannot discourage us than to intimidate us in any way that he possibly can that we might stop in our tracks and stop doing what God has called us to do and stop being obedient to the call of God in our lives, individually, as families, and yes, even as a church. And so I I preach this message to myself before I even preach it to you this morning. But folks, whatever it is that Satan is using to intimidate you this morning from carrying out his will and his way in your life, from answering his call and fulfilling the mission that he has given to you, or even the mission that he has given to Ramoth Baptist Church, might we hear from God this morning through his word what it means and to be able to stand firm against intimidation just as we were to stand firm against discouragement when it comes we stand firm against intimidation when it comes as well from our spiritual opponent if you have your copy of god's word able to stand uh, this morning as we stand together and read uh, from nehemiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 10. this is nehemiah speaking now i went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was restricted to his house. We'll come back to that in a moment. Th- think, if you will, uh, house arrest in today's terms. He, he was restricted to his house. Uh, but Mehetabel said to Nehemiah, Let, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the temple doors. That, that sounds reasonable. What better place to meet than the house of God? What better place to meet than in the temple? But as we'll see in just a moment, sometimes it's not the the evil but sometimes it's the good that gets in the way of the best or the great that gets us into trouble why were they going to meet there because he said they're coming to kill you who's coming to kill them? nehemiah's opponents we've seen them crop up in chapters two chapter four again at the first part of chapter six and throughout this chapter we see tobiah and geshem and sanballat that continue to attack and continue uh, to be the opponents that satan uses to stop the rebuilding of the walls they're they're coming to kill you they're coming to kill you what tonight so in other words don't think about it they're coming to kill you tonight verse 11 but i said this is nehemiah again should a man like me run away how can someone like me enter the temple and live these four words we'll come back to in just these four words i will not go I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done, and also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. Then in verse 15, uh, we see uh, what, what happens when you stay the course. The wall was completed in 52 days on the 25th day, the month of Elul. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. And during those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Arah. And his son, Jehonanah, had married the daughter of Meshulam, 
son of Berechiah. These nobles kept mentioning Tobias' good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him. And Tobias sent letters to intimidate me. Father, we thank you this morning uh, for your word. And Father, we thank you even in the midst of intimidation uh, from our spiritual enemy, Satan. Father, that you have given us the resources and the tools to be able uh, to uh, stare down, to face down, and to stand firm in the face of intimidation. Father, I pray this morning that as we open your word, as we study it, Father, that you would not only help us to clearly understand, but Father, that you might apply it to our day-to-day lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Folks, four things this morning. As we answer this simple question, how can you and I stand firm against intimidation when it comes? Not just discouragement, but out and out intimidation. Uh, We see here in verse 10, particularly, again, uh, Metatable was restricted to his house. In other words, he was on house arrest. He was not able to leave his house and even go to the temple. Going to the temple would have been a good thing under normal circumstances. Nothing wrong with going to the temple, nothing wrong with worshiping God. In fact, that's where uh, the Jews should have been, worshiping the Lord. That's one of the reasons why God sent Nehemiah back to Jerusalem, was to rebuild the walls around the city so that the people of Israel could safely worship the Lord in the temple that had already been rebuilt. Wow, what what a wonderful suggestion to go to the temple, to meet in the, the house of God in the temple. In, in other words, let's shut the, the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. And then he tacks on this, they're coming to kill you tonight. In other words, Nehemiah, don't think about it. It's good. Go to the temple, to the house of God. No problems, no worries. You'll be there. I'll be there. Everything will be okay. We'll see in just a moment. Nehemiah would realize the reason behind this ruse. But at the very moment, I want to point us to to these words of of Nehemiah. Four simple words, but ones that we might live by today. When he simply said this, I will not go. You see, we must resist intimidation when it comes. And it will come in many forms. It it came in the form here of Metatable. And over and over, it came in the form of Tobiah and Sanballat and Geshem, the Arab. It it came from all sides. It came from all sources. And Nehemiah was not immune, not just to discouragement, but to intimidation. And on this particular night, come, come to the temple. Come to the house of God. Come to worship. Don't think about it. And it isn't Isn't that the way that the intimidator works? Isn't that the way that the master opponent works? Isn't that the way that Satan works when he wants us to simply, even as Christians, to shut off our minds, to shut off our thinking process? And say, don't, don't, it sounds good. See, that's what sin does. Sin sounds good. It's, It's pleasant for a season. Sounds good. Even going to the temple into the house of God sounded good. But you see, our master opponent will pervert that which is good, that which is even God-ordained, into that which is sinful in and of itself. And so come to the temple, come to worship. And Nehemiah would not have it. And he stopped. And he said these four, I will not go. He would go to the temple, to the house of God, and worship at other times. But on this occasion, he knew that it was a trap. And instead of simply not thinking, he resisted that which came by way of intimidation. Folks, this morning, we must simply think. And as we think, there will be times in our life, times in your life, and in my life, times even in the life of the church, where things will look good and the spiritual opponent and enemy will bait us, if you will, into doing that which looks good in and of itself, but which is really used for sinful purposes. And we simply must be at a point in our spiritual life and our spiritual journey to be able to say, I will not go. I will not do it. I will not give in. I will not give up. I will not go that that was nehemiah's word just in that moment but it was a lifetime 
as we walk together with the Lord. Folks, understand, as we mature in our faith, and if you're here this morning, if you've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, or if you're spiritually mature beyond your chronological age, the more spiritually mature that we get, the easier it should be for us to resist intimidation and discouragement when it comes and to simply be able to stand firm and to say, I will not go. In fact, Paul shares this very, excuse me, James shares this very word in James chapter 4, verse 7. That when he writes, therefore what? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He'll run away. Folks, don't miss this. If you're a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you're on offense. You're not on defense. You're on offense. Why? Because the victory has been secured. I'm about to jump up and down. Man, the victory has been secured. He, he's done it. We're on it. Now, now, the devil would tell you differently. The devil would say, no, I, I'm the one that's still on offense. I'm prowling about it. No, Jesus is victorious, and if you are are marching under the banner of King Jesus, then you are marching on offense. And every time that we are under the banner, every time we submit to the lordship, to the kingship of Jesus Christ, every time a church submits to the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ, that old devil will flee from us because we're marching under the banner of Christ. And when we're marching under the banner of Christ, devil and culture and world get out of the way. But we're not. Then old Satan will, he'll, he'll stand and say, no, folks, we are marching under the banner of King Jesus. Submit to the Lord as King of kings and Lord of lords. Resist the devil. Resist his intimidation, and he will flee from you. Folks, what, what do you need to resist this morning? What is it that the spiritual enemy is trying to put into your life? to get you to just stop what you're doing to stop being obedient to the lord to stop moving forward with god and this morning i would, would submit resist intimidation when it comes resistance begins every day every day is a new day we we, we hear that word a lot these days resist and resistance uh, folks it, the bible tells us what we're to resist and how we're to resist and it really begins right here for Resistance is a choice that begins in the mind. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age. What does he mean by this age? The world, the, the culture, the, the worldview. But what rather be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. So that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Folks, we need to, to every day make a choice to be renewed in our mind. Why? Because it begins in our mind. Our emotions are all over the place. But man, if you, if you look at, at my emotions, you look at your emotions, if we were honest with ourselves, it depends on what day, and sometimes it depends on what time of day, where, where we're here or where we're there. But the choice to resist really begins in the mind. As we renew our mind, as we renew our mind through God's word, as we renew our mind through prayer, as we renew our mind through fellowship and worship together, as we renew our mind, we're able to submit to the Lord. Folks, what is it that you need to resist that's intimidating you today? Begin with God, submitting to him. And then renew your mind each and every day. But not only are we to resist intimidation when it comes, folks, we're to realize intimidation for what it is. Realize intimidation for what it is. Look back at verse 12. What does Nehemiah say? I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him, and here's the reason. Verse 13, don't miss this. He was hired so that I would be intimidated to do as he suggested, sin, get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. It's all in one verse about what intimidation is really designed to do. Spiritual intimidation is used by Satan to cause us to stumble or to sin. But if Nehemiah would have been seen with table there in the temple in the house of God, even though that's where he could have been and should have been on any other rightful day, to be seen with someone who was under house arrest would have brought Nehemiah's name into 
disrepute. Ah, he's associating with somebody that he shouldn't have been associated. It was all a setup. Folks, understand this was all a setup from the very beginning. And Nehemiah understood it. I will not go. And then he realized, wait a minute, not going to happen. Why? Because sin is crafty. Sin is sneaky. And sin, most of the time, will come in forms that are otherwise good, but which Satan has perverted to his own pleasure and use. Nehemiah said, I I realize what was happening now. It would have caused him to stumble. It would have given Nehemiah a bad reputation. It would have brought uh, disrepute to him. But folks, understand, it's not just when Nehemiah would have sinned. It's when we all sin because we're all part of the body of Christ. There's not a single one of us that does not affect the other. And so when we fall into the intimidation tactics of the spiritual enemy and do that which we are not supposed to do, then we not only stumble and fall, but we bring disrepute upon our good name. And not just upon our good name, but we bring disrepute upon the body of Christ. And unfortunately, we bring disrepute upon the name of Jesus himself. Sin is not something to be taken lightly. We all stumble and fall from time to time, and if we were honest with ourselves, we'll stumble and fall even yet today. Maybe something that we should have done and we simply did not do. Maybe something we should have refrained from doing and we did anyway. Most when intimidation comes, particularly in the form of sin, might we resist it? And might we realize it for what it is? It's not for our good, but it's really for our bad. But third this morning, folks understand intimidation will not last. Remember, it it will not last. Look in verse 14, yet yet another one of these simple uh, one-verse prayers that says so much. My God, remember to buy and stand a lot for what they have done and also the prophetess Noadiah and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate. Notice now he's now moved into the past tense. He, he's, he's over. He, he said, I, I will not go. I realize it for what it is. And now, God, you deal with it. Folks, so many times we try to take things into our own hands. I, I grew up, anybody grew up watching Judge Wapner? People's Court. I love, I love that. Back in the day. You remember what old Doug Llewellyn said? Remember, don't take the law into your own hands. You take them to court. Now, that, that, you shouldn't. But how many times do we try to take things into our own hands? All, all the time. How many times do we try to deal with that with which we are simply incapable of dealing with? All the time. How many times do we try to, to deal with what God says I got it. I, I got it. It's, o- it's okay. I, I'm in control. It's, o- it's okay. I, I got, I'll, I'll, I'll never let go. My, my eye's on you. I'll, I'll never let go. It's, it's okay. You, you, can, you can let that go now. It's okay. But so many times we simply fail to let go of that which is intimidating instead of saying, God, I, I, got, I, I, don't, I don't use this phrase too often. And I think it can be trite. But sometimes we simply do need to to let go and let God do what he's going to do instead of doing it ourselves. Folks, we we need to to resist and we need to, to realize, but we need to remember that intimidation won't last long because God's got it covered. God, God, if his eye is on the sparrow, Man, his, his eye was on Tobiah and Sanballat and Geshem the Arab. His eye was on Metatabal, who tried to set up old Nehemiah. He, if God's eye is on the spirit, his eye is on you and me, but his eye is also on those who would seek to intimidate and to be used by Satan to stop us dead in our tracks. Make no mistake about it. God's got it covered. He's got it under control. Now, I don't know what's out of control in your life, what's seeming to intimidate you at this very moment. 
maybe it's your marriage maybe it's your finances maybe it's your job maybe it's your kids for many and I'm, I'm, I, I can relate this past week for many it's it's health that as we grow older can become that intimidating factor in our life but I don't know what it is that you, you face intimidation wise but I know what I face intimidation wise and every time I try to just keep a hold of it and figure it out it doesn't work out so well God, God's got it under control. He's got it covered. Remember, intimidation won't last because Jesus is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. He says, I will be with you each and every day. I'll never let you go. What is it that this morning you simply need to let go of and let God handle? That you've tried and tried and tried, but today is the day. But you simply need to let it go and say, God, I, I can't do it. I can't take care of it. But I know you can. And then that gets us to the last, where we rejoice that intimidation will lose. We can rejoice intimidation will lose. Verse 15, don't, don't miss the significance of this. The wall was completed in 52 days. Wow, now we, we're just, well, you know, 52 days, that's pretty good. Could, may, could have been 48, 52, okay. We get, you, you read about the, uh, the funding that was just given and, and released for I-95, especially around uh, the Occoquan. How many of you have been coming south on the Occoquan and come to a dead, complete stop? And you, ha where's the wreck? Where's the wreck? Where's the car on the side of the road, broken down? Nothing, nowhere, it just comes to a complete and utter stop. So 95, they're going to get funds. We're going to have uh, supposedly a new bridge built across the Rappahannock, uh, kind of linking in 17 uh, with Central Park. Wonderful, great. When? It's going to be a long time. It's not going to be no stinking 52 days. It's going to, now, let's get the people that built the wall in Jerusalem to work on I-95 and the bridges around here, and then we'll get something done. Whoa, bless the Makaros, whoa. We'll get something, man, 52 days to build. A, can you imagine the whole wall repaired and built all the way around the holy city? Talk about time of rejoicing and why did they rejoice don't miss this verse 16 when all our enemies heard this that the wall had been completed all the surrounding nations they were intimidated they lost their confidence for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God glory was it about what Nehemiah and the people of Israel did it was about what God did in and through Nehemiah and the people of Israel. It was just all about, as Pastor just shared, it's all about his glory. The wall was about his glory. The church is about his glory. What happens tonight at the Super Bowl is about his glory. It's all about him it's not about us and for nehemiah and the people of israel 52 days in the midst of discouragement in the midst of opposition in the midst of intimidation and they got it done because they kept their eye on the lord folks this morning our spiritual enemy would love nothing more than for us to just stop in our tracks, to just stop being obedient, to just stop being uh, moving forward, to stop moving forward in our marriages, to stop moving forward uh, with our kids, to stop uh, moving forward in our jobs, to stop moving forward in, in the church, to just stop moving forward in the light, just say, you know, I might as well give up. 
and just go along to get along. Folks, God's got something greater in store for you and for me. God's got something greater in store for Ramoth Baptist Church today and in the days ahead. But today is a day that we stand firm against intimidation when it comes. For it will come. Discouragement will come. But his eye is always on the sparrow. But even more importantly, his eye is on you and me. And oh no, oh no, he never lets go. Through the storm, through the ups and downs of life, he's got us. He's got it. It out there. I'm going to just say it ain't. Ain't another word, but I'm going to, that out there ain't bigger than God. So whatever it is, let him take care of it. And then watch what he and he alone will do through you and me and through a people who just like Nehemiah say, God, you give us the victory in and through Jesus Christ, who says it is finished. It's finished. Let's pray. Father God, thank you.